Thank you. So when I was asked to speak here, uh, I was talked through the topics of the day and how we're talking about ecosystems and open banking, open insurance, and APIs. And I looked at the agenda, and I saw my slot was 2 o'clock, straight after lunch. And I was reminded of a, a conference I was at last year, a um, DevOps conference called DevOps Talks down in Melbourne. And they had a, a barista coffee machine. So you could go and queue up and get your coffee. Very good coffee, I must say. And the, th the strange thing was it was sponsored by a, a company called Message Media. And they're a company that allow you to send messages, SMS messages, through an API. So they have their API servers. You, you write your application. So you could put it into your mobile app or into your web app or, or wherever and send messages. And the coffee cart was set up to receive messages so you could book your coffee. So you could say, I want a flat white. At, uh, my name's Ian Ward. They would make the coffee, and you could just rock up, pick it up. And I thought, well, that's a really good example of an ecosystem. So anybody can put this into their application, and they're, they're away. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had that now? Because then everyone could have a coffee, and they'd wake up, and I wouldn't need to keep you awake. But since we don't, I'm just going to have to shout every now and again to wake you up. Um, we'll see how that goes. So APIs are everywhere. We've seen them this morning talking about all the different ways we can use them in the, in the ecosystems, and we're promoting them. How many of you here today have APIs in production already? So about half of you, that's good. Now keep your hands up. And can you take your hand down if you have been hacked on your API. No? OK. So that means the rest of you just don't know you've been hacked yet. I've got a, a good friend of mine said uh, there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. And it's all, in all seriousness, the world is becoming a dangerous place. And APIs are a target. We see it all the time. The web breaches are in the news every day. Data breaches of all sorts of different types in large and small organizations. And we really need to be aware of them. I mean, one of the biggest, obviously, the Facebook uh, wasn't really a data breach, but it was, a, it was data got out, as was mentioned this morning, uh, in the very good presentation on, on how to secure your APIs, data got out, and that's what we need to avoid. And it's not just the reputational damage that this can cause. Obviously, Facebook has suffered enormously from reputational damage. But there's also, also an economic impact, obviously, especially when we're talking financial ecosystems. And there was a recent study by IBM called the 2018 Cost of Data Breach Study. And I won't go into all the details, but there's a few really key things that, that really struck home for me. And that was that the average cost, uh, sorry, the average time to identify a data breach is 197 days. So somebody hacks your site, and you just don't know about it. And people are abusing your your data, and that's not good. Perhaps even more scary is the fact that it takes, on average, 69 days to fix it. So you're sitting there, knowing you've been breached, trying to get your IT department to patch the hole, and it's taking, on average, 69 days to fix it. That's a scary, scary thought. The average, day, average cost of a sorry about that, average cost of a data breach is around 3.86 million U.S. dollars. Big number. That's up 6.4 percent, and it's going up every year. But perhaps even more scary is when we look at the large data breaches. When you're looking at a breach which involves the, the loss of 
more than a million records, then the, the cost is astronomical, $40 million. And it goes up and up, obviously, the more data that's lost. It's a serious issue that needs to be thought about. And the problem is that information security experts say it's not getting better, it's getting harder to stop data breaches. The traditional information security approach is not working. The traditional information security at the end of a deployment cycle, so developers develop, the testers test, and then the information security come and say, hang on, you want to put that in production? What is it? I haven't seen it before. They start looking at it, they go through their checkboxes, and they do their own tests, their own uh, penetration tests, they do their own checks, and they do a very good job in general of stopping bad things getting to production. But today it's all about agility, it's all about getting our, our changes, our new APIs into production quickly before the competition. And if you've got information security at the end of your, of your deployment cycle, that just means that you lose all of your agility. And if you don't have them, then you get data breaches. So it's time to rethink how we do security. But it's okay. It's not as bad as I'm making out. We've got some good news for you. And the answer is blockchain. What? But it's the answer to everything, right? You just stick blockchain in, and, and it's all going to fix everything. Now, I can see you're skeptical. So I'll talk about a few other things, and I'll come back to blockchain uh, at the end. So obviously, as has been mentioned several times during sessions, the easiest and most cost-effective way to secure your APIs is to implement an API management solution. And it just so happens that Software AG, where I work, we have a really, really good one. So if you want to come by our booth later, I can talk to you about that. That will give you a lot of things. It will give you uh, security at an um, authentication authorization level. It will give you denial of service attack protection. It will give you lifecycle management of your APIs as you generate them, as you version them, as you put them into production. It gives you a lot of capability. And I would say that today, a solution like this is table stakes. You can't even think about putting APIs into production in a sensible way without having a rigorous uh, API management solution in place. So you've got to be at least thinking about putting one of these in. But I'm going to say that's not enough. Because as I said, the developers are developing APIs. They're developing the code. And they're handing them over to the API management to, to be secured. But at the end of the day, the actual API is implemented by somebody in code at the back end. And oftentimes, that code is written using third party libraries, often open source libraries. And as we move to uh, an environment where developers are given more freedom to choose the technology they want to use, then they look for solutions. And Often, if they don't have a good solution on hand, they'll go to Google and they'll search for what's the best way to do something. There's a third party open source library. Maybe they download it. Maybe they write the API to use that library. And those libraries can have vulnerabilities in them. Vulnerabilities may come up in those libraries later on. And they could cause you problems. So it's time to think about how we change the way we do security. And what I mean by that is information security, as I said, is typically at the end of the cycle. It's typically not involved early on in development. And I would say that's an issue. It's a problem. We need to turn our information security experts, the one who really know what the problems are and how to resolve them, turn them from police with their checkboxes into teachers. We need to help them 
to help our developers and everyone in the organization to understand what the risks are associated with the creation of any, any public-facing API or application. And these guys know what they're talking about. They've been doing it for years. They know what the risks are. And those risks are very publicly known. There are reports about the sorts of problems that are most commonly involved in data breaches. And so if we can get those people to help our developers, then our developers will grow and they'll become more capable. And more importantly, they'll take ownership of security. And the title there is DevSecOps. And the reason for that is it, it's grown out of the DevOps movement of a cultural change for our developers to take more responsibility for operating the software that they write. And with DevSecOps, we're saying, and, and DevOps was always meant to have security in it, by the way. Uh, if you haven't read it, there's a really good book called The Phoenix Project. Uh, it's, it's a novel about DevOps, which is, sounds a bit weird, but it's actually quite a good read. It's uh, a bit of a roller coaster. It starts off with a, a, a company in dire straits, and it shows how implementing DevOps turns the company around. Sorry about that. Just a, a little aside. But security was always meant to be part of DevOps, but um, because it's generally been forgotten, the new term DevSecOps has, has evolved and it really talks about how we want to make everybody in the organization responsible for security. So every developer, every tester, should be thinking about what would happen if this went live and it wasn't secure. In the same way as with DevOps, developers are thinking, how will this operate in, in production? So give them the power and the authority and the responsibility to make good decisions when they're writing code. Those DevSec, uh, sorry, those InfoSec people can also be involved in evolving your DevOps pipeline, in your continuous integration pipeline, to incorporate security at every level. So when the developers check in code, it can do scans for the use of known vulnerabilities in their libraries. So it doesn't even get out of development before you've spotted a potential problem they can also be involved in automating penetration tests along the way. So the, the InfoSec people become key to enabling the organization in the same way that ops people were empowered to generate the DevOps pipelines in places like Google with their site reliability engineers. They're, it's an ev evolution of the job role to help the organization in a different way. Now, here's a scary slide. I was saying the, the, the common vulnerabilities are well known. They've been evolving over time as different people use them. These are the, the Open Web App Security Project OWASP top 10. This is, uh, there, were, there were two versions. There was a version in 2010, and, and this is the, the updated version 2013. And they continuously monitor what's going on in, in the world, what's going on in, in terms of data breaches. This list, 2013, it's not new. And I don't expect you to read it and understand it. But I do expect your developers to read it and understand it. It's, on each of these things, there are known ways to avoid these pitfalls, to avoid these problems. So, I highly recommend that you get your InfoSec people talking to your developers and get them to look through these things so that they can develop defensively. The next thing you can do and should do and kind of have to do is automate. Because, as I've said, the security is getting harder. There are more and more breaches, and you really cannot assume that you're going to stop a breach from happening. To assume that you ha are secure is, is a fallacy. And so, if you assume that you're going to be breached, then remember, 
the average was 69 days to fix a breach. So you know you've been breached. If it takes you 69 days to deploy a new version of your software, then it takes you 69 days. So if you fix it, even if you fixed it, if it's got to go through a massive life cycle of, of uh, a massive cycle of tests, manual tests, user acceptance tests before you can get it into production, then either you skip those tests or you take 69 days. Or, and that's an average. So uh, I think uh, Equifax was, was longer than that. The other thing about automation is that it gives you a huge number of other benefits. There was a, a very good talk yesterday by Christopher of uh, platform.sh talking about the benefits of DevOps, about automation in terms of the increased agility that you'll give your organization. And my mantra is if you, if you have to do it more than twice, then automate it. Don't do it manually, automate it. And that's not just continuous integration where you take your code, you compile it, and you test it. This is everything from automating the, the uh, creation of infrastructure, either with virtual machines or, as is now much easier, with cloud. Being able to stand up a new instance to, to run a new complete copy of your software in a cloud environment allows you to be able to test it, allows you to be able to run in parallel old version, new version, and flip over when you know it's safe gives you the ability to automatically take a fix from development, a hot fix, a patch for a vulnerability, and get it into production in a short time. Now, AWS, and uh, I think it's 10 deploys a, a second or something stupid they do. You don't need to be there, but you do need to be somewhere close. You need to be under an hour to deploy a fix, which means automating your whole build pipeline, your whole deployment pipeline. And as, as we said yesterday, automation is not the holy grail. It's not going to fix everything, but it is required in today's environment. So OK, we've got our InfoSec people. They've, they've taught our developers to, to uh, to program defensively, so we're not generating uh, known, known vulnerabilities. We've put in a, an API, uh, API management platform, an API gateway, preferably a software AG one, because it's really good. So we're safe now, right? It's all great. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Another possibility is that Either you've already got a breach into your system, into your development environment, or you've got a rogue actor in your development environment. And that could be through social engineering. It could be through any number of means. But if you've got a bad actor in your organization, then you've potentially got a problem. All of our larger organizations, especially financial insula installations, lock down production really heavily. So every bank I've worked with, developers don't have access to production. You can't get into production data. You, uh, for even the ops people to be able to touch production data, it's usually four eyes. They have to have two people to be able to do anything. And there's a certain amount of governance there and a certain amount of, of, of uh, security. But we don't do that with our development environments, and we don't do that with our testing environments. And in many cases, it's possible for somebody to put a change into code in, in the test environment or in the development environment and have it automatically moved into production, which in many cases would be found by all of the standard testing. But with APIs, there's a scary possibility that somebody could add a new method, a hidden method, to an API and have that method available in production to be, the, to be able to exploit it. And because it's a standard part of your application, it's a standard part of the deployment. It's not necessarily found by any of the standard tools that would, would detect that sort of, of uh, breach. So it's a, it's a dangerous and scary thing. So 
what we need to do is to think how can we make sure that whatever is done in development and in test first is, is audited and logged and we have to make sure that the, the people in those environments aren't able to delete those logs because I would, if I did something naughty, I'd go and delete the log, right? So we need to be taking those logs and storing them safely and there are techniques for, for doing that, offloading all of the logs to a safe place and making sure that they're audited. So at least if somebody does something wrong, you've got a place to look to find who did it, when they did it and, and what have you. We also need to be looking at our deployment pipeline and auditing the things we do in our deployment pipeline. And if we audit every test we do in the deployment, every uh, movement of data, every, every deployment into production, then at least we've got a log and we can say we've been diligent in performing the, the right things. And when we're in a, an ecosystem, it's our APIs are core to other people's businesses. And you can well, well imagine that other partners, other players in this ecosystem are going to want to know that you're being uh, diligent and following the right best practices in those things. So wouldn't it be great if we had a way of auditing those deployments and auditing the steps in those deployments in a way that was immutable? And just so happens there's a technology out there that allows you to create records in an immutable log that you can share with the partners in the ecosystem and allow them to view the fact that you're being diligent and, and uh, that sort of thing. And that's blockchain. So I wasn't inventing the idea of using blockchain in this uh, scenario. I'm not saying it's the best idea. I'm not saying it's relevant for all parties, but there is certainly a, a use case. And in fact, there was an interesting report by Ernst and Young. Uh, let's see if I can get the name. Uh, blockchain in DevOps. I've got a link if somebody wants it. And it talks about this sort of thing, using blockchain in a, a distributed environment to enable people to, to have confidence in the APIs or in the, in the deployments within an environment, especially when you've got multiple development teams deploying different things and making sure that everyone understands what's going on. Now, there's one last thing I wanted to, to cover. I don't know how we're doing for time. Doing OK. So one last thing I wanted to cover was, remember I said that the average time to identify a breach is 167 days, sorry, 197 days. That's, that's quite a long time, isn't it? 197 days. Now, we're pretty sure we're creating pretty good code. We're pretty sure that we've got a good perimeter security, but it would be nice to understand if we had a breach before 197 days. So one of the things that we're working on with, our, with a few customers is applying the same technology which we use today for surveillance of uh, traders in, in the trading scenario and the same technology that we use for, for surveillance of fraud in credit cards which is streaming analytics with machine learning applying that to watching the traffic going through your APIs and learning what's normal behavior what's normal traffic and allowing it to spot anomalies that could potentially be evidence of a, a breach and irregular usage. Now, it's obviously very early days. The models don't exist today to be able to, to do that, but it's certainly something that I think is interesting for the future. So drawing to a close, I want to just remind you first, I like coffee, but more importantly, what's essential for rethinking security? First, it's a, a leading API gateway from a provider that makes API, uh, API management a, a, um, a core 
a core technology, is making all the investments to make sure that it's up to date, make sure that it, it supports all of the standards that are coming up. Make sure that the, the developers understand the risks and take responsibility for creating secure code and automate everything. Everything in your deployment pipeline should be automated. You don't want people manually deploying code because that's just risky and dangerous. And of course, that's really DevSecOps. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. You got us scared at the beginning with big figures, but hopefully you get some answers in the next step. So thank you very much for that. Any questions for Ian? We've got time for one or two questions. While well, the next speaker is yeah, setting up. Yes, thank you. Hi, a um, bit of a blockchain skeptic here. Um, yep. Uh, so I'm a bit of a blockchain skeptic, and when you popped up blockchain, you know, I had to chuckle because, of course, it is the buzzword of the day. Um, I see the value and the benefits of blockchain, especially as you pointed out, it is the immutable log store and things of that kind. But the problem with blockchain also is it's a very expensive computational device, and logs by nature are many, right? How do you see... I mean, it's a very specific question, I guess, but how do you see those two things coming together where, on the one hand, you've just got tons and tons of things coming through, and most blockchain implementations process, what, about seven messages a second, something thereabouts? Yeah, so I, too, am a bit of a blockchain skeptic, and to be perfectly frank, I, I put in blockchain to, to cause a conversation, right? But I have heard it, you heard it talked about, that the idea is that it will be used. And it's in specific places. And the, the performance issues won't be a problem, I guess, because it's in your deployment, deployment path. So it's when you deploy the code to prove that you've gone through the, the right steps to, to compile the code and test it, to deploy and put the security checks in. So it's not going to be hundreds of times a second. It's going to be small numbers of times a second. And I guess it's, it's really, really going to be a value when you've got that ecosystem and you don't trust each other enough, which you kind of have to trust the people in your ecosystem, I guess, but, and in the case of regulation. So when the regulators say, you have to do these checks, to be able to demonstrate to the regulators that you've done them in a, uh, in a good way will, we'll, I think, stave off deep, deep regulation. If we, can, if we can auto regulate, then we won't have uh, too, much, too much trouble. Any other questions? OK. Will you be uh, standing at the booth? Uh, yep, we'll be out uh, in the partner. Excellent. So if you have any questions popping up, please go to uh, Software AG booth uh, uh, in, the, in the village, partner village, so that you can ask your questions. Thank you.